Hi everyone. Welcome to this King's Fund online event sponsored by B Braun. Today we'll be talking about how technological innovation can usher in a new era of care and how this can transform the quality of care and really enhance the patient experience. I'm Bemi Babalola. I'm a senior analyst here at the King's Fund and I'll be chairing this event with our very insightful speakers. We have Nikki Stubbs, professional lead for nursing at Leeds Community Healthcare NHS Trust. We have Mandy Griffin, Managing Director of the Health Informatics Service at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Trust. We also have Graham Walsh, Chief Clinical Information Officer and Consultant Knee Surgeon at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust. And we have Harriet Buck, Strategic Partnership Manager at B Braun. So I really want to thank our sponsors B Braun uh, for helping this uh, come to light. So I'll explain a little bit about how this session is going to work. This is a pre-recorded event, so we've taken a range of questions from yourselves, our audience, which would have happened during the registration process. If you're watching the live broadcast on the 9th of September, then do feel free to submit more questions via Slido. So there should be a box next to this video where you can do so. Our speakers will be watching live alongside you and will be able to respond to these questions. There will also be poll questions during the session, so please do join in and respond to them as you see them popping up. And if you'd like to follow the conversation online via Twitter, please use the hashtag KFOnline. And if you're after further resources, any further reading and information, there is a resources tab to the right of the video. Now, ahead of time, Harriet interviewed a patient, Nick, who went through the experience of a knee replacement surgery at Calderdale Royal Hospital back in February 2019. Having suffered with knee pain for several years and struggling to perform daily tasks and coaching rugby, he was listed for a day case knee replacement and was able to lead his own rehabilitation and recovery with the orthopedic pathway. So let's hear what Nick had to say. What was most important to you regarding your experience of care? Um, when they came through, I looked, it, it, I think the communication, the, 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 the people involved and, and the and care by its definition, I suppose, really, just so well looked after everything real with real clarity. I mean, I was well aware it was something that was sort of new to the trust that I was in. Um, so that, you know, I suppose care by people looking after me um, just felt so reassured from, from the minute we started consultations um, to, you know, to, to literally all the way through, really. So that, that, would, that were really good. Okay. And in what ways has technology improved your experience of care and empowerment throughout your treatment? It, it, I found it amazing. It, it was, you know, expecting, knowing people that have had a you know, knee replacement and sort of expecting a lot of pain, expecting a lot of immobility, expecting a lot of difficult, potential difficulties, you know, going back and forth. Um, the, the technology, so I'm, I'm post-op really, um, with the, you know, monitoring the my movement and range of movement three times a day as opposed to going, having to hobble to a physio or getting a physio to come out to me, the physio team. That day-to-day -day, um, sort of pushing yourself through your recovery uh, was, was key. You know, being able to make comments to your physio, you know, to you guys, um, you know, this is working, this isn't working. Um, that was good. And then, and then sort of, I suppose post-op and rehab stuff, not almost not having to go in again pre-COVID, aren't we? But not having to go into the hospital, you know, doing doing consultations over over Zoom or over over whatever form of you know technology we used um, for for a ten minute. How's your knee? Here, have a look. Um, I, th I thought that were that were really um, forward thinking, and I suppose in current climate where hospitals, you know, you can't go in. It, it sort of preempted everything. And I would imagine things will have moved on so quick now that mm. it'll be, it'll default to the way, the way it'll go. So yes, well, well, in, well in front of the time, I think. Well in front. Yes, uh, just, just in front of the curve of COVID, I think. Definitely. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. V visionary. <laughs> so looking back, what could have been done differently that would have helped you feel more in control and empowered? This could be um, technology or people related. 
I, I think I've said this before, and, and when I looked at the questions, I, I sort of wrapped my brains and even try to be a little bit cynical, and and I'm being dead genuine um, from, from literally start to finish. Um, it was, it, it was great. <laughs> I suppose it, the, the physio, the physio post so six, post six weeks um, wasn't wasn't as good, but that was due to communications from the trust. Um, I did my six weeks, and then it, it essentially I, I I didn't get a call back for another X amount of weeks. Um, but to be fair, I'd, I'd been do, I had I had my own stuff, I had my stuff to do anyway, so they were really checkups. But the actual through the procedure, you know, to to leave in the same day um, and then everything that followed with the recovery. The, the pain that I had was, you know, talking to others was so managed, so being able to manage it so much for me and and, and the recovery that I had. Um, it, You know, I think I would try to get back to work after nine weeks, not 12, uh, because mm. I were I were good to go, you know. So, yeah, the process, I, you know, I really am struggling to, to find something that, that could be improved. You know, without you know going into hospital meals or you know you know jam on my toast. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so no, That's it was great. good. Yeah, really good. Great. So would you say that throughout the experience you were empowered using the technology? Yeah, you you, you had some ownership. You had ownership of you know the, the situation or the the operation that I had. Uh, ownership of the recovery. You know, and again in current climate. End of a end of a phone, as it was in my case, or end of a end of a call, be it a text, be it a message. Um, you know, every, everyone were there. Be it even you know, consultant and atheist, physio. You know, the technology side from you guys. This is working right straight on it. So, yeah, in that respect, it, it was it was really good. Now let's hear some introductions from the speakers. Starting with Mandy, can you tell us about yourself, your work in this area, and any reflections you have on Nick's interview? Hi, I'm Mandy Griffin. I'm the Managing Director of Digital Health for the Health Informatics Service. I've been working with the Trust as Director for the last five years and have had a great job of introducing their digital strategy over a number of years. I watched Nick's interview and it's not the first time I've uh, seen Nick. I've seen Nick in person. And what come across to me is the absolute convenience that technology had given him as part of his care. Um, and, and I think what it shows is uh, the technology is not just about accessing information about people. It can really help people uh, recover and it can help them recover much quickly. His overall passion is quite unbelievable. And it was quite interesting when Harry asked the question in regards to could he criticise any of his care? He really struggled uh, to come up with something. And I think that says a lot. I think it says a lot for what we can do for our population. And I, for one, working alongside Graham, are looking for other reasons and ways we can develop technology to enhance care uh, that makes people's recovery much quicker. Thank you, Mandy. Can I come to Nikki now? Hi, I'm Nikki Stubbs. Um, I have worked in nursing for over 37 years and um, my most recent job has been as a professional lead. Uh, during that time, I've developed services that have looked at integrating um, primary care and uh, community care, trying to break down some of the barriers that exist between those services. I think Everybody probably thinks that when you talk about community care, it includes GPs and district nurses and um, everything in between. But actually, they are quite they are two quite distinct animals. Um, generally speaking, primary care are private businesses run by GPs um, who have got a, a focus on making money, whereas um, community services are NHS services where obviously there's a slightly different focus. So just to be really clear for the audience about the, the difference between those, those two things. Um, so in terms of the video, well, it was, you know, he's a good Yorkshire lad and it was nice to see him um, there having a, you know, being very enthusiastic about the care that he'd received. And whilst I can't necessarily speak about um, orthopaedic surgery, I think that what he 
said mirrors a lot of what I hear from patients about um, self-empowerment and being able to lead their own care. And I think he's a really good example of that. Thank you. And can I come to you, Graham? Um, yeah, so I'm Graham Walsh and um, I think Nick was one of my uh, patients and, you know, I'm a knee surgeon by kind of trade, um, but I've also been lucky enough to also take on the role of the uh, Chief Clinical Information Officer at the Trust and work alongside Mandy. And I think what's kind of interesting, you know, my passion is uh, about patient pathways and improving the patient experience, you know, and, and the CCIO role allows me to kind of see how we can embed digital technology and to improve that experience. And I think Nick kind of, you know, is testament to that. He was our very first patient on our digital pathway. Um, he, his enthusiasm for, for kind of working with us, uh, his enthusiasm to the staff, you know, everyone saw that actually day case surgery was possible and using digital technology we've proved that actually not only is it possible but it's much safer you know and nick throughout the entire time was was really working hard with the exercises normally a patient would be left on their own um you know with a, a physio out, outpatient appointment once every week or once every second week this way nick had feedback every day he knew his goals and he could set his own personal goals and i think he really did kind of really buy into this um and was you know really a pioneer at the uh, uh, you know at calderdale and i think he's really helped other patients along because you know he's been the person we've we've turned to when we need we need some support and uh, you know and, and help along the way because you know technology is not about the digital side it's about the patient you know and there's no point bringing any technology in unless it's really going to improve something for the patient and i think this pathway really has shown that we can make a big difference um you know along the patient journey and improve outcomes thank you and can i come to you harriet Hi, thank you. So um, I'm a strategic partnership manager at B Braun and I'm responsible for um, developing and setting up uh, what we call strategic partnership pathways. And they've been specifically designed to address some of the challenges that we face in healthcare. So one of the pathways that I've developed is the orthopedic pathway, uh, which involves um, integrating technology within the care pathway to improve patient experience and the outcomes. So during that interview with Nick, it was very clear to me that he enjoyed being part of the pathway and being uh, empowered to take ownership of his care. And that was really demonstrated in all of his follow ups and his recovery. You know, in just three weeks, his range of motion was that of a patient that you would normally see at six to eight weeks. And that was really refreshing for us to see as industry that, um, you know, working with hospitals in partnership um, can improve the uh, not only the patient experience but also the outcomes thank you harriet now we have a number of really interesting questions submitted by yourselves the audience as you were registering and it's clear that there have been a few themes that have come to light which we're really going to delve in today through this discussion so firstly let's talk about how technology has supported patient safety and personalized care graham can i invite you to kick us off with this conversation but i think technology it's you know it brings with it uh, so much potential you know this was you know this pathway we talk about was a very simple piece of uh, technology which was wearable technology um, and it would monitor patients rehabilitation um, not just the range of motion but also the uh, degree that they were adhering to the rehabilitation afterwards and making sure they were doing their bits and pieces. It's just an example of, of, of many types of wearable technology, you know, whether it's um, monitoring the diabetic patient in the community, uh, whether it's monitoring the patients at home um, who are at risk of falls. Lots of this technology really does you know, enhance patient safety. We can now manage patients away from the hospital where previously we would have had to have managed them within the hospital setting. You know, the, the fact that Nick went home as a day case, you know, traditional knee replacements, you know, patients could stay anywhere between three to five days. Um, but having this ability to monitor patients remotely has given us the confidence. Now, this is to say is this is an orthopedic pathway. However, you know, it's it, any other pathway could have a very similar, um, you know, process and um, the ability to give a, the, the doctor, the nurse, um, the clinical teams, the confidence to know that their patient is being managed in the community safely is really important. And I think this is what, you know, as a surgeon, I was so pleased that this came along um, because I, you know, I knew that we could 
get patients home, but I needed to make sure we could get patients home safely. And I needed to make sure that we were monitoring them and keeping an eye on them. You know, and the added bonus, you know, Nick could message us if he had a problem or a question and we could respond straight away. You know, and then I think in the old days, it may be that a patient would have to ring his secretary and have an outpatient appointment, which would, you know, waste unnecessary time. But, you know, this kind of quick instant messaging, this quick feedback to patients means that, you know, digital, although geographically he was distant, he felt a lot closer to us than, you know, and, and closer and part of that team. So I think, yeah, patient safety is paramount to everything that we do. And I think technology helps us really deliver that. Brilliant. Thank you. Harriet, did you have any reflections? Um, I very much second what Graham said, really. The, the technology is being designed um, to be a benefit to both clinicians and patients. From the clinician's perspective, it allows them to be able to tailor the care that in the home environment that otherwise they wouldn't normally get to do. They can keep an eye on patients' pain scores, um, range of motion, quality of motion as well. And then of course they can keep in contact with them regularly to ensure that they're with them every step of the way throughout their rehabilitation. Mandy, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, as well as the personalised care and the monitoring and the information that provides the clinician, we've got to think about the underpinning infrastructure that we put behind all this. So Calderdale and Huddersfield Foundation Trust, I think, have been privileged to have some large investment in deploying an electronic patient record. So as well as having the information from the patient monitoring, we've also got their patient record online. So whether it be Graham or a nurse or a community worker, everybody could access the same information, even at the same time, to check what diagnosis that patient had and then help further with their care. So it's really important when we move into projects like this, we also look at the underpinning infrastructure because that can only enhance the whole experience. And Nikki, I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts, particularly thinking about how that information is received out in the community and how that actually enables patients to interact. Yeah, I mean, as Mandy said, the use of um, an electronic patient record is really helpful. So uh, Mandy said EPR, so that's what it stands for. Um, so, um, you know, and making sure that the same system exists within um, all the healthcare providers, and sometimes that doesn't always happen. Um, I think Cold Calderdale are very fortunate in that regard, but where I've worked in Leeds, we have lots of different um, electronic patient systems, and many of them don't speak to each other. Uh, I think the other thing as well that's really important is, you know, what I didn't mention in my introduction is that actually I'm, I'm a wound care specialist by background, which means I look after the, um, the probably undesirable outcomes of Graham's interventions, um, which might be, you know, infection or um, wound breakdown. And I think one of the innovations that we've used in the community is just, for example, the use of simple film dressings, which are see-through, which enable us to observe surgical wounds without having to expose the patient to infection because we don't need to review the, to remove them, sorry, in order to review the wound. But I think there's just a bit of caution for me. So I think an innovation is great, but without evidence, it can be dangerous. So I think, you know, with, um, you know, because it, it can encourage clinicians to adopt something without really having any sort of proven benefit of effect or without having reviewed what the potential costs of that might be. So I think a really good example of that is topical negative pressure. So it's been, there's a wholesale adoption of topical negative pressure and yet there is a dearth of evidence around its impact. And what there is, is a very small studies. There is a large randomized control trial going on at the moment, but I think it's just that word of caution. We do need that evidence to back up these innovations. And that leads quite nicely into the next area, which is around, you know, how do you actually communicate effectively between the different steps of care? And Nikki, if I can come back to you on that one, I think you mentioned that, the actual data systems can be different sometimes. So how do you make sure you're actually enabling continuity of the service and making sure that commu solid communication is still at the forefront? It can sometimes be almost impossible. 
Um, so there will be information that may well get sent home with the patient, but that will be a letter. That letter often goes to the GP. The GP doesn't necessarily always get it onto the system, scan it onto the system immediately. It'll be waiting for a secretary to do that. Um, and therefore, sometimes community nurses are going to see patients at home once they've been discharged. Um, and they're a bit blind, really, to, to why, they've, why they're, they're necessarily going in. They'll have a brief referral, but um, the... the extent of that referral and the accuracy of that referral is very varied and will depend a lot on the pressures at which the nurse that was discharging the patient was under whilst they were in hospital. If you're having to discharge 10 patients due to you know bed pressures very quickly then obviously the, the quality of the referrals might not be as, as good as that one might hope. So there are some real difficulties um, but I think you know the NHS electronic and digital um, systems are very well reported. There's <laughs> not always been, there's been a lot invested in them and yet there hasn't always been the most desirable outcomes. But I think the best way forward is just for us to accept that actually we all just should be using the same system. Um, the problem with that is that the digital systems that exist have got a vested interest in getting people on board because that's what keeps them afloat. And Mandy, I wondered if you could share any learning from your experience, um, kind of reflecting on, you know, what does work in enabling that communication to be effective? Absolutely. Um, so I do uh, agree with what's been said. But I, I think, again, um, in, our, in our local area, we've, made, we've been able to make some real significant progress. So as part of our deployment of the electronic patient record, we introduced a health information exchange which allowed us, along with some other software, to connect to the System 1 record, which is our local system of choice for our GPs, as well as our EMIS systems. Um, and we're currently working on the same connectivity with our social care colleagues in Calderdale. So I absolutely agree there is lots of work to be done in order to pull these systems together, but it's actually happening now in pockets, but it is. There's a national programme called Local Healthcare Record Exemplar. And I think progress has been slow in, in places. And here in Calderdale, we just decided, you know what, we're going to try and connect as much information as we possibly can. And not only are we going to connect it, we're going to connect it in real time. And we've actually done that. We've got to broaden that now out to the greater Huddersfield area, but at least we've made a start. And, and I think there are pockets up and down the country where that has happened. I know now my community nurses can see the patient record. We know our clinicians in the hospital can see the GP record. And we also know our GPs can see our uh, electronic patient record. And I think we've made a good spot, start, but there's lots to do. Thank you, Mandy. So, of course, you know, we're hearing a bit about just how influential and just how beneficial uh, the technology can be. The audience do want to know, however, what are the potential limitations of digital care? What type of things do we need to be looking out for once we're trying to make this as successful as possible? And Graham, I wondered if you wanted to start off uh, with, with your experiences. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's, I think one thing that is probably apparent even from this small talk is that, you know, digital adoption across healthcare networks is very different in different areas. Um, you know, and I think it's important that, you know, we, we, we acknowledge that. I think technology is, it has to be about the patient. You know, it can't be because it's shiny and it's new and it's great and I want to play with this toy. You know, we, the reason for bringing technology in is to something that's going to either improve the uh, patient engagement, improve patient outcomes, or in, even improve um, staff engagement and, uh, and reduce some of the stresses um, and improve some of the working life of staff. So, you know, certainly at Calderdale, what we do is we try and we help hold that ethos. We have a digital ways of working and every everything we do, we engage with as many um, people, whether that's community, whether that's the GPs, whether that's patient groups. Um, we understand that, you know, as you, you know, there is a degree of digital poverty. Not everybody has, you know, the ability to access all the digital information we need. We know that, 
You know, not every patient we have has a smartphone that can download an app. Not everybody has a laptop that can do some of the remote working. You know, and we're looking at ways we could look in community hubs so we could have digital hubs in the community that people can go to, you know. Um, but we also have to recognize that digital doesn't solve everything. You know, we still have to have, you know, the traditional methods of care open to us because what digital can do and, you know, for example, in this, going back to this pathway, it might take a lot of patients out of the process of needing follow-up physio. So it takes the burden off some of the traditional care models, but they need to coexist. Um, so I think for digital, yes, it's innovation. And going back to Nikki's point is certainly we would make sure, and we definitely, you know, with anything that we do, we make sure that everything we do is governed properly. And, you know, we're not just doing things for the sake of it. Um, but I think, you know, we have to consider that not everybody is as digital savvy as Ed the next man. And we need to make sure that everybody has access to the right technology. And if they don't have the technology, they have to have access to traditional methods of care. OK, so Mandy, if I can come to you, what are your thoughts on whether technology is the answer? What limitations do you see in digital care? So I do agree with a lot of what Graham said. And no, technology is not the answer to everything because I see it as a key enabler. Um, I think it's really important and certainly over the last few months where digital acceleration has been, has been at its best really, where we've been forced into using technology to provide care to keep our patients safe and that's keeping them away from the hospital. But I think we can learn from that experience. And when we talk about digital inclusion and those people that are less fortunate and don't have access to technology, then what we should be doing is making sure that those people that do have access get their care, but maybe digitally, so we can create safe space for those people that are not quite as privileged and we can bring them to the hospital in a more safe environment. That said, and, and some of the things that Graham has talked about, about developing these digital hubs, can only help those people, uh, but it's not a quick fix. And I think that's the important thing. So we need to deal with those things we can influence quickly. And certainly the learning over, over the last four months has helped inform how we move into the new normal when it comes to delivering healthcare. So thinking about how we're moving out of hospital settings, what might that look like in terms of limitations in the community, if I come to you on that, Nikki, and how you see that progressing as we're entering the recovery phase of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things really that sort of spring to my mind. I think one of one really useful piece of reading is the People's Plan for 2021. And, you know, there's very clear instruction from our customers if you like that you know we should um, make everyone matter and leave no one behind and I think there's got to be some investment in from the NHS to support those people in poverty to ensure that they have equal access to um, technology um, and that they shouldn't be excluded because um, they are you know they don't can't afford wi-fi or haven't got a smartphone um, so I think that's there's one of those things which applies to the whole of the NHS. I don't think it's a particular community problem. I think one of the things for me is around staff engagement. And um, I think sometimes staff can feel really rather nervous about the introduction of technology that, you know, perhaps it will replace um, the physiotherapist. We know that we don't have enough physios trained in this country. Um, and probably and across all of the devolved nations. Um, but actually what this does, it seems to me, is enable the few physios that we've got to focus really hard on those people who, for whom digital technology isn't working. Um, so Graham and Mandy have talked very much about um, and Harriet as well, about being able to determine the sort of the strength and um, pain levels and you know the, the the benefit of the activity that the patient's undergoing from a in a virtual way um but it also enables us to very very clearly identify those for whom it isn't working and and that's where we would target our resource so i think it's, it is about engaging our clinicians because um, you know it can feel quite scary um when 
technology seem to replace the human being, but I don't think it ever will in a neither in a community setting nor a, nor in a, an acute setting. Harriet, did you want to add anything further to that? Yeah, absolutely. It was very much in the forefront of our mind when we designed the orthopaedic pathway that we didn't want to um, separate patients and um, seclude those patients that didn't have access to technology. Um, and so that we made sure that the system could work even if the patient didn't have their own smart device. If a carer or a community therapist was visiting that patient, they could still perform their exercise and the data would be transferred to the hospital so they could still keep an eye on them in their home environment. And um, that's been quite important to us um, so that we're not separating any patient from the digital care that they um, that is available for everybody. So many questions were asked around how the workforce is brought along with the vision when it comes to making technological improvements. Harriet, did you want to start off by sharing some reflections on how we can make sure that workforce resilience is built in? So it's important to us that each clinician is engaged throughout the entire orthopaedic pathway from the nursing team to the uh, physiotherapist to the porters, the surgeon, the anaesthetist. Each clinician um, has to be engaged in, in what's happening, what the technology is, and everybody needs to be singing from the same song sheet right from the beginning. And I, and I think once the clinicians are exposed to this, um, it's very easy for them to, to get on board and, and be part of the whole process, making the journey for the patient uh, much easier and, um, and the patient can feel more reassured. Now, Graham, you've been in these very teams that Harriet is outlining. Do you have any reflections on what, was, what it was like being part of that team effort and, and what you'd like to see moving forward? And I think, you know, I think the definition is the team, you know, and I think, you know, it's it's not about an individual. It's not about a surgeon being a surgeon. You know, we all we know that surgeons sometimes can have a reputation of you know, of wanting to steal the show. Um, but, you know, we're part of the team. And, you know, and I think when we when we started this project, we were originally doing um, normal day case needs in one hospital. So we wanted to bring the digital pathway. We brought the hospitals together. We brought our community services. We brought. We have a local service for physio called Akala, um, and also our our other um, physiotherapists. We brought everyone together as a team, so everyone felt part of the process of getting this project up and running. We made sure that staff were happy at every step along the way, because if anybody had an issue, we would we would address that. Um, we would stop the project if needed. You know, and and. A th you know, I think we saw when a team works together like this, the patient feels that and the patient feels the confidence that they can go along with this project as well. And I think we saw that with this and you've seen Nick's interview. And I think Nick was very confident going into this because everyone around him was saying the same thing. You know, and it's with any technology we, we bring in. It's not the individual. It's not the technology. It's making sure that everybody adopts and everyone buys into it because a project will only work if everybody works together, you know, and the patient has become part of that team. And I think that's where digital allows us to really push the boundaries. The patient isn't the patient anymore. The patient is part of that recovery phase, part of that project. Um, you know, and I think that's really, you know, what we did here. And I think from the inception of this project to the f delivery of the first patient was six weeks. You know, and that kind of shows you, you know, how people are bought into this and how successful it was. OK, so we've heard just how critical it is to have the patient centric view when carrying out teamwork, particularly in large workforces. But how does this play out when we're thinking about care outside of the hospital and making sure we are covering all parts of the team and not just the not just those in hospital? Nikki, are you able to share some reflections? I think working in community is a very different animal. So the patient is always at the centre because you, you visit them at home and um, you know, you're know you a guest in their home. It's very different when you put someone in a pair of pyjamas and put them in a bed away from home on a ward. Um, and I think this is why this project works so well because actually you don't, um, you don't extract that patient from the family and the support network that they have because it's day case and they can go home quickly. Um, so um, I think one of the things that, you know, is really useful about some of the work that's been doing to engage patients in community and in other settings is um, around reducing silo working. Unless we reduce silo working, we've, it's gonna be really challenging for us all to work together. And um, 
and if we unless we all work together then the patient's probably going to receive the raw end of that deal so i know that health education england are investing a significant amount of money in creating um the expansion of multidisciplinary teams in the community across primary care and and uh, community care to make sure that we've got enough people and leaders particularly amongst all the community um, clinicians to um, drive care in the community and so and most importantly to respond to local need and that will differ you know across Leeds and across Calderdale and across Huddersfield all of those needs will be very different and we need to be able to respond to those appropriately um, and digital technology will be part of that um, but there will be some areas where there are particular challenges around poverty, et cetera, which will, you know, if we're not very careful, we'll leave those people behind and we just need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I think that's possibly felt more in community because you obviously experience the way people live. Um, if you only see a patient in a hospital environment, it might not be so easy to understand the challenges that they face on a day to day basis, just having enough to eat um, and being able to keep the heating on and those kinds of things, let alone have access to a family member with a smartphone, for example. Now you've touched on something very important there, Nikki, the concept of making sure that particular population groups aren't being left behind as we progress with technological advancements. And I wonder if Mandy, you could start to share some thoughts on how we can ensure that we're using technology to achieve authentic relationships that genuinely empower the patients? So it's, it's, a it's a difficult question to answer because I think there's a lot of variation up and down the country and there's certainly a lot of variation in Calderdale. Um, we have a chief exec that has done a lot of research around the BAME communities and health inequalities across Calderdale. And again, we've been looking at data that helps us identify the gap and if you think about the data and how we captured it, that is that is through our electronic patient records or other means. So I think there's a big job to to um, to really understand what the gaps really are and where they are, because I think there's variation right right across different settings. I think the point I'd like to make following um, the answers that you've had over the last couple of minutes is what I reflect on is is the leadership piece. And I know Nikki talked about good leaders. And, and for me, my experience and the people I've worked with, that bit has been more important than anything else. Because if you've got good leadership and those people that want to understand what we need to do from a workforce pr perspective, as well as a patient perspective, and it's led from the top, you've almost got a better chance. And, and you know, we've got that leadership in, in a social care setting, in a community setting, and in, in an acute setting. We, we can all behave in a certain way to make a difference to the patients. I think the culture of an organization is really important. And that's how we address these problems, because I don't think we have. I don't think we've addressed these problems yet, but I think we can with the right leadership and the right information to take us forward. And Harriet, did you have any thoughts particularly on the use of data to ensure that we're trying to capture these marginalised populations? Um, yeah, absolutely. At, at Bebron, we um, are trying to gain a lot of insight into sort of population health and data. And um, in particular, we use HES data analytics a lot um, alongside any of our um, pathway projects. And this is really to try and give us a bit of an insight into what's happening now and how can we as industry adapt our products and services to, to fit into that. And there's a lot of learning that we need to do and partnerships that we can develop within the NHS can only help us um, achieve, achieve this moving forwards. So we've heard a bit about how there could be potential barriers through the use of digital. But what about other types of barriers, for example, culture, leadership? How does that come into play in terms of how we make sure that this quality improvement is taking place? And Graham, I wondered if you could touch on this. Yeah, I mean, I think basically Mandy mentioned leadership. And I think, you know, that is, a, you know, such an important, powerful thing that we have, particularly at Calderdale. You know, we have a, um, a CEO who is very 
very much driven by you know improving patient outcomes using digital so we've gone on a journey um, where we've had investment um, both time um, and money to make these things happen um, I think you know the uh, we're also very very lucky to have a you know very, very good business analysis where we can look at communities um, and we can look at differential care and we can look at you know as, as Mandy mentioned the Bain community and you know when we can respond to that and I think you know we need to respond we need to recognize that you know all communities are very different you know what we see in the north may be very different from what you see down south you know and, and I think you know we need to use technology to drive that we need to improve the way we report and um, we need to improve the way we analyze data and therefore how we deliver care and whether we use technology to deliver that or whether we use traditional methods we have to you know potentially use the technology to decide which path we follow you know we have to invest in our communities we have to invest in areas that you know do have that technology poverty do have you know health inequalities and you know that is really important but i think none of this can happen without the right leadership you know, the leadership has to, you know, it has to take us forward. You know, we can bring anything we want in, but if you've not got the leadership, nothing will change. And I think, you know, we've been very lucky. We've had great leaders where we are, and I think, you know, we continue to do so. And I think, you know, for me as a CCIO, I've been very lucky in that, you know, anything that I've wanted to do, anything that I've wanted, to, I've had the support, which I think makes a big difference to not only, you know, myself, but also patients and also um, members of staff within an organisation that they, they feel listened to. Thank you, Graham. Did anybody have any thoughts that they wanted to share based on what Graham's just said? Nikki? Uh, I think the, one of the things that we've not really talked about, and um, and th there was a reason for that, that we don't want to make this a COVID-19 issue, but um, I think there is a lot that we can learn from COVID-19. And um, I think we use a lot of terms in the NHS and beyond such as vulnerable and impoverished and and that means a lot to different people and means entirely different things to different people i think we've got to be a bit more savvy about what 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 those terms mean rather than having sort of like a a blanket um approach to um the vulnerable or the impoverished or bm bame communities um uh, i think the other thing as well is that there's obviously a drive from Simon Stevens and from um, central government to achieve massive targets around getting back to normal following COVID-19. And we're not gonna be able to do that without investment in technology. Everybody's drive from kind of refresh and transform or whatever you call it, wherever you work, um, and all the changes that were made within uh, services as a result of, of COVID-19 and the lockdown. Um, if we're going to gain any speed that we need to do before winter comes, and we're not far away, uh, then we've got to have, you know, ready access to, to technological solutions. Um, apparently 60% of outpatient follow-up appointments, they, they want doing by phone. Um, so, you know, and that's before the winter. So if that's what's going to be achievable, it'll be interesting to see what Graham thinks about that in terms of the feasibility. But, you know, there are there are some huge targets out there. And I think we just need to be um, learning from COVID-19. Um, but also, as I said, as we've said lots, making sure we don't leave anyone behind. Graham, did you want to come in on that in terms of understanding the feasibility and particularly thinking about how are you know, we going to ensure that patients feel able and confident to use digital services, particularly as we see the winter period coming up and we are still trying to recover from COVID? Well, I think, it, you know, I, I think as we recover from COVID, um, you know, and I think, you know, our tagline we have is bit of bet business better than usual. And I think that's true. You know, we've learned a lot during COVID that has really enhanced the way we deliver care. You know, you, you could speak to a room of surgeons even six months ago and asked them to do a video consultation and they'd be all oh, known the patient wants to come and see me. The reality is now it, patients accept it. We know that patient groups prefer 
not to come into hospital, whether that's because of um, concerns over COVID or whether that's the convenience of not having to find a parking spot. You know, and I think we, we've learned a lot and we, we need to make sure that we, you know, we adapt, we move forward. And, you know, what, what was accepted before we accept the new norm. You know, I do a lot of my clinics now, either on the telephone or on video conferences. And patients get the same rich experience. Patients can ask questions. You know, we, you know, you can't examine a patient admittedly, but you can get clues and hints to where their problem is, um, you know, and, and reduce the un unnecessary amount of footfall that we have in hospitals. And I think it's important we don't lose this impetus and, you know, we move forward. And I think technology is the key to this, you know, whether we use um, whatever platform we use to deliver this, we, you know, we need to encourage people not to go back to the old ways you know we need to encourage people to realize that actually the patient comes first and you know if we can answer and address the concerns of the patient via a telephone or a video we should be doing that if we use technology to monitor the patient remotely and that feeds into you know in, into a dashboard that we can monitor we need to be using that and i think as nikki says we need to continue with the investment we can only go back to a normal kind of way of working or a better way of working if we do have that investment. And I think we need to invest it wisely. And then that's where, you know, the focus has to be on patient groups and has to be on community groups where we, we look to see what, what patients want and what they already have. And that phrase, business better than usual, really stands out. And I wondered if anybody else had any reflections on what that could look like in the next couple of months. So, so on reflection of what both Nikki and Graham have said and, and making sure we continue with the investment and, and I wholeheartedly agree with, with that. I think one of the reflections I have from the pre-COVID times is we were always looking for perfection before we would ever deploy anything. We had to dot every I and cross every T. Uh, but I think COVID has learned that we can move, we can move at pace and um, a new colleague who joined the trust a few months ago often uses the phrase of continuous improvement and don't seek for perfection because it is about continuous improvement and that's that adoption um, and taking our workforce with us. We've talked a lot about the patient today and that's absolutely right because they should be at the forefront of our minds. But one of the things we do need to concentrate on is bringing our workforce with us. And uh, I think Nikki mentioned earlier about people being a little bit frightened of, of, of technology. I think we need to capture the learning from COVID because I think what we have done is grown people's confidence. And we need to capture that and keep the momentum going. I think that's really important. So as we draw this really interesting discussion to a close, I'd like to invite each of the speakers to share any final thoughts and reflections. Can I start with you, Nikki? Uh, I think we've said so much and I think, you know, we've, um, I think it's been a really, really helpful discussion. Um, I think as I kept saying, we, you know, I think the summary for me is don't leave anyone behind, don't leave patients behind, don't leave staff behind, don't leave any organisations behind. We've seen what's happened with care homes over COVID. We need to make sure that they factor into all of these digital innovations. So I think that would be my mantra going forward from this discussion. And can I come to you, Mandy? Yeah, so I absolutely agree with what Nikki say, but the, the bit for me is, I think we've got an absolute exciting future going forward with technology. I think there's lots of opportunity. And if we get it right, we can do right by the patient and the workforce. Graham. And I think, you know, to it, 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 we're at the start of a journey, you know, there's a, you know, we're, we're only at the beginning of what we can deliver you know with with, the, with artificial intelligence and all the newer technologies coming through the potential we can offer to patient care moving forward a, and also you know as, as mandy mentioned the staff as well you know remote working you know there's, there's so much we can do and i think you know let's take this time to reflect you know and move forward and make sure what we do is as i say is 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 business better than usual and harriet i think um you know, I, I agree with, with, with what everybody said, but from industry's perspective, it's been so important to, for us to work with the NHS and gain a deeper understanding of what your needs are so that we can tailor our solutions to tie in with what your plans are. And uh, I think moving forwards, keeping that relationship strong will be integral to the future development of technology and how we can implement that um, across multiple pathways, not just the orthopedic pathway.
So I want to give a huge thank you to our speakers who have kindly come along today to share their really insightful reflections. And of course, thank you to the audience uh, for watching and joining in with us. Please do share the link to the event with your colleagues if they weren't able to make it and they'll be able to watch it on demand. And what you'll see is a feedback button will appear at the bottom of the screen. And if you could please, please give us some feedback, we'll be sending out a survey link in an email shortly. We do really appreciate and value all of your feedback and that helps us to make sure that we're shaping our events, ensuring that we're providing the most helpful content for you all. So again, a big thank you to our sponsors, Be Braun. Take care, everybody, and goodbye.